Hi, my name's Tina and I'd like to welcome you to Feedback Loop 2 for the Mid North Coast Safe Space. Um, we'd just like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land that we're all on. Um, we, we're located in many different parts of Australia, but um, in particular, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which the safe space will be um, set up and acknowledge that there are a number of Aboriginal groups and Aboriginal people who are very closely connected to the land in the mid north coast region. We'd also like to acknowledge the expertise that people of lived experience have brought to this process. So the purpose of what we're doing today is to provide you information about the co-design process so far and also to um, give you that opportunity to also contribute to the co-design through completing the survey. We'll have a link for a survey at the end. Um, so what we've had happen so far, we've had people who have um, watched orientation webinars, um, been provided a whole lot of information, including information from the Ministry of Health about what they require in a safe space. We've had conversations with people who have lived experience in the mid north coast area um, and we, we had a particularly in-depth session where they told us about their needs um, and how those needs might be able to be met and what they have as a vision for the safe space. We then had a first feedback loop where people were told about what had come out of our conversations with people with lived experience in uh, the mid north coast area and um, after that, we had our co-design sessions with health professionals in the area. Um, so the purpose of what we're doing today is to let you know what's come out of those conversations. Um, and in particular, what came out of the conversation that we had with health professionals in the North Coast um, just last week. So, what I'm going to present to you now is the information that has come out of all of those, um, those meetings. We've had a whole lot of Zoom sessions and we've had face-to-face -face sessions with people with lived experience and just the information that's been provided that um, is really relevant to the, the co-design of the safe space. So here are some of the ideas that people with lived experience in the area have. Um, in terms of the environment of the safe space, they would like a non-clinical environment with nice soft background sounds and privacy screens. Uh, people with lived experience would like an environment that makes them feel validated. They want a calm and safe environment with privacy and confidentiality, and they've suggested that there be separate consultation rooms. They'd like there to be an outside area with a courtyard um, and then inside the safe space, uh, that it's really important to people that they have things to distract them, things to calm them. So they've suggested nature videos, um, a jukebox with a selection of music, some sensory activities, comfortable couches, um, space and time to reduce distress, a snack machine with healthy options, tea and coffee available for free. They also made some comments about um, what they need in terms of access to the safe space. They'd like it to be easily recognisable and easy to find. And they'd also like it to be open to everyone and never closed. They'd like free parking to be available. They made it very clear that it needs to be parking that is not timed um, in an area that's well lit with secure parking, um, but they'd also like it to be accessible by public transport. They've suggested that transport be available for the safe space, so a bus or a van that can um, provide people transport between where they are and the safe space. And um, they have made the point that they don't want it to be a drop-in centre for everyone. So they want it to be there for people who are specifically experiencing a suicidal crisis. And what you've got at the bottom here is a quote from one of the participants who told us, I want to leave the safe space with a sense of hope a sense of somebody has really listened and understood me and I have a pathway for moving forward. 
people with lived experience in the area told us a little bit about what they'd like the experience to be like when they go to a safe space. They said they'd like to be welcomed with a smile um, and greeted by a peer worker with a lived experience of suicide. They'd like good connections with other services. Someone suggests that it would be like a bar and bay day spa. Um, it was um, raised to that they should invite other service providers to the space to connect and collaborate with people. They'd like a dedicated event coordinator to organise activities for the safe space, such as a barbecue. There should be friendly communication between guests and staff. They said they should be given a clipboard or an iPad to write their information down and that no guest will be forced to do anything against their wishes. Um, but remembering that a peer worker does have a duty of care. Comment was made that we need to ensure the space is right for conversation and let the guests decide so that their comfort and their voice can be heard under their terms. In terms of the support that's being offered in the safe space, People with lived experience in the mid North Coast area have said they'd like a non-clinical environment and they'd like support, non-clinical support. They said it should be just a place that you know is always there. They'd like to receive immediate support, so no waiting, and they'd like valid, relevant, up-to-date information and resources. They'd like to discuss options and work with peer workers um, about potential pathways and tools. They'd like follow up, and that was something that was really stressed. They, they said, don't lose me. So after people have left the safe space, they wanna have some kind of contact made with them. They'd like collaboration with other services and safe, confidential and understanding supportive environment with no judgment. They raised the need for warm handovers, including the guest, peer worker and clinicians when this is required. Staffing was something that there was, um, there were some diverse points of view on staffing amongst people who were um, present at the, at the co-design meetings for lived experience. So what was agreed on was that the place should be staffed by peer workers with a lived experience of suicide. And they would also like diversity in that lived experience. They'd like peer workers that allow people to be heard and they'd like them to be experienced and knowledgeable. They said that peer workers who have current knowledge about other supports and services and wisdom about what's good and bad is really essential. <clears throat> So where there were some differences of opinion in um, the conversations we had with people of lived experience were around the role of clinicians in the safe space. So some participants, but not all participants, felt that it might be necessary to have clinicians involved. Um, and the group discussed how that might be incorporated into a non-clinical service model because the Ministry of Health have made it clear that um, clinical services will not be delivered in the safe space. So some of the suggestions that people with lived experience made for this was that peer workers um, be trained to screen guests for suitability and also that clinicians be available to consult with peer workers if needed. So after we fed back that information to the community using our first feedback loop, we invited people to participate in a survey. Um, and there were nine responses to the lived experience survey. So I'm gonna show you now what came out of that survey. So lived experience respondents agreed that the slides that I've just taken you through um, presented that those slides mostly resonated with their own experiences and needs. Um, further perspectives that were provided in addition to what we already had was um, that there's a limited capability of emergency department staff um, because they're not trained, not necessarily trained in mental health triage and assessment. Also, we were told in the survey that um, there's a limited availability of support offered within the emergency department. And there's also long waiting times. 
Um, <clears throat> And that's in addition to the limited availability of beds within the mental health team. <clears throat> the survey also brought out the comment that um, there's the need to ensure access is available to the service across the LHD and not just in one town. Now, so there was some concern that, um, that if the safe space is set up in, in Port Macquarie, that um, there may be other parts of the local health district that would find it difficult to access that. Lived experience respondents in the survey generally agreed with the draft values and princ principles that were presented. And I'll, I'll go through those with you a little bit later. Um, but some interesting comments that were made about those in the survey, um, the addition of trauma-informed and strengths-based approaches um, they suggested to reconsider the use of the word rules. Um, they raised the need to get input from all health professionals. And also one respondent stated that they didn't agree with the draft values and principles. The survey showed that people with lived experience in the area, um, they, they they felt that um, what was most important or not already captured in the information that we presented, um, the most important stuff was ensuring access is available from different locations in the LHD um, to align the establishment of local safe spaces with the greatest areas of need. Um, and it was raised that there needs to be consideration of First Nations and cold populations. Um, they also said that we need to reinforce that the surface is staffed by peer workers with a lived experience of suicidality in a non-clinical environment. It was, um, in terms of what was important, one of the things that was seen as important was that the safe space provides friendly and non-judgmental support through active listening and understanding. And that the promoting of the service to key system touch points, um, for example, general practice is important. And also it was reiterated that the safe space needs to respect the confidentiality of guests through the design of this physical space. And they need to find innovative ways for guests to check in. So that's what we found out through our survey of lived experience participants in the area. Um, what I'm going to show you now is the outcomes of the survey that we had after our first feedback loop for health professionals in Mid North Coast. So we had four people respond to that survey for health pro professionals. Um, and the information they provided us um, out of the four health professionals who responded, two agreed that the, with the information that was presented from the conversations with health professionals reflected their own experiences. The other two didn't answer that question. In terms of current issues and challenges, health professionals in the Mid North Coast area told us that judgment and stigma is a major issue. Um, the lack of after hours services in towns, lack of walk-in services and not being able to contact appropriate support out of hours. Um, so the default is ambulance transport to hospital and um, health professionals felt that that was inadequate. Health professionals also raised the time and um, resourcing the number of staff that are available as an issue. They said that the emergency department is an unfit environment and that there's a lack of safe space to support someone when they're in, dis in distress. They also commented on the lack of time and the lack of appropriate training for responding to people in a suicidal crisis. The survey respondents also provided us some information about needs and ideas for the safe space. Um, we were told that there's a need for training to be provided around connecting and exploring in a non-clinical way for health professionals. And it was pointed out that, you know, this is going to be a non-clinical space and that health prof professionals have no experience in, um, in, in having 
being providing those non-clinical services. Um, another person said, I want to be proud of the space and the people working in it. We were told it needs to be a big enough space to have two or three consumers in. It needs to be somewhere that people can use as a literal safe space and not feel like they're being rushed out. Health professionals also told us that they want to be able to ha hand over to someone as soon as they arrive so that the patient feels safe. It was suggested that a crisis cafe environment would be the best way to set up the safe space um, and that it should be a standalone service that's centrally located um, and can be accessed after work and after school hours by people of all ages. Health professionals did say that it's important that it be peer led and um, that access to support work, uh, that it, what people need to be able to access is secure, calm, non-confronting non environment. Now, all of this co-design and um, the feedback that we've got from surveys, um, we also have other information that we want to share with you because in the Mid-North Coast area, there have been a whole lot of conversations outside the co-design process as well. Um, so these separate conversations have, um, there's, there's been a lot of decisions made about changes to emergency department processes and environments um, and general responses to people in a suicidal crisis. And some of these conversations have directly related to the safe space. So I'm just gonna share with you now some of the information that has come from these external processes that have not been part of the co-design um, because they obviously reflect um, the thoughts of people in the Mid-North Coast area. Um, so the first thing is that um, conversations were had in a co-design environment um, that was separate to this one about what the pillars for success would be for um, the setting up of new alternatives to ED. The, it was decided at these um, meetings that by December 2020, anyone experiencing suicidal um, ideation in Port Macquarie will be able to access a safe space as an alternative to ED and 100% will feel empowered and welcome to return. There were also decisions made about what or where the service would be. It was decided that it should be a welcoming, safe, non-clinical, co-designed and culturally appropriate space, um, that it provides safe work practices while maintaining therapeutic environment for consumers. It should be an off-site location accessible by both the Port Macquarie community and the hospital site by public transport. In terms of who the service would be for, it'd be for people experiencing suicidal thoughts, their carers, family and supporters. Those, it would also be for those who are currently not accessing services um, as an alternative to those who would currently access the emergency department. Um, there were conversations held too around who the service is not for and um, it was decided that it would not be for people who are acutely behaviorally disturbed, acutely intoxicated with alcohol or illicit drugs or need assessment in the emergency department. In terms of the team, um, it was envisaged that it be two full-time positions for peer workers, um, appointed clinician, one full-time, um, also would have <clears throat> input from community volunteers and when needed there'd be access to consultations with the Port Macquarie Community Mental Health Services, the youth and family team um, and clinical nurse consultants. In terms of the location for the alternative to ED service, um, the objective of this external process that took place in Mid-North Coast was to determine a location for the services. Um, and the outcomes were that several options were identified. Um, however, they didn't all meet the criteria of the lived experience of suicide group that has been set up in the Mid-North Coast. 
Um, but some of the options included the Chamber of Commerce commercial building, the glass house, the library, the youth hub, and a demountable near community health. So it was decided that they would develop an expression of interest to identify a location or a partner for um, having the safe space and to send out identified lists proactively. So the lived experience of suicide group in the Mid-North Coast who called themselves the Leos, um, they also said what they need in terms of a setting and a location. And um, they have raised the need for easy access, disabled access, uh, public transport, confidentiality. So they don't want a CBD location because they want to be able to access the safe space without um, necessarily being seen by lots of people. Um, they'd like to be linked in with other mental health services um, and they'd like kitchen with tea, coffee and beverages, um, comfort, not, it needs to be a non-clinical space, a home feeling, um, so there should be no formal reception, it should just be a tranquil setting. They'd like an outdoor area or a courtyard, a sensory room with choices, uh, but also a consult room and a lounge room. They feel there should be no age limits um, and they'd like there to be resources for carers available, um, support for parents and loved ones when somebody um, is receiving support in the, south, in the safe space. They'd also, they raised again this issue of parking, um, that there needs to be off street parking and that it needs to be not time limited. And they said it should be a free service so people should not be required to be receiving NDIS funding in order to access the service. And they would like the opportunity for more than business hours of operation. So um, for instance, being open at times in the evening. It was also decided um, during these external conversations that there should be effective engagement of the Leos who were the people with lived experience who provided um, the information I just went through about the sp safe space environment. Um, so the outcomes I would like is for the Leos group to be established, to receive training from Roses in the Ocean, and that's actually already occurred. Um, so the, the LHD has already uh, paid for the um, the Leos to, to participate in Roses in the Ocean training. Um, they also said it's important to have some Leos who don't access the mental health services that are available in the area, um, roughly a 40-60 split. In terms of actions, it's been suggested that clinicians um, do some training with Roses in the Ocean and also the identified key clinicians or managers um, should be issuing invitations to that training. In terms of governance, um, it was decided during these external conversations that the objective should be to develop a flexible governance system that dovetails with NGO partner governance and allows for a graduate, um, graduated trans a graduated transition to full LHD ACS clinical governance. So I'm now going to take you back to the formal co-design process um, and what has come out of those sessions. Um, specifically looking now at what came out of the conversations that we had with health professionals in our last co-design session. Um, some of the things we talked about in that session were the findings from the first feedback loop, the location of the safe space, the service model, connection pathways to the safe space and from the safe space, staffing and workforce development and support, and governance. And here are some of the questions that we focused on. So with values, what will the safe space hold itself to? Um, the location of the safe space and where that will be. Um, connection pathways to the safe space. So how are people going to access it? And also the outward connections. So where will the safe space connect people to? When will they do 
this and why will they do this? We talked about staffing and who will de deliver the support in the safe space, as well as the development needs of those staff and how the staff will be developed over time. We spoke about the service model, which involved looking at what support people will receive in the safe space. And we also looked at the physical environment and accessibility. So we looked at, um, you know, what will the safe space look like? Um, how will people access it? And we spoke about governance. So who'll be involved in overseeing clinical and operational aspects of the safe space. So I'm gonna take you through what information was provided to us by health professionals in the mid North Coast area during these conversations. So um, in, in terms of location, and my understanding is that a location has been decided upon, um, but some of the things that came out of that conversation is that uh, sites are currently being considered, um, included the associated capital expenditure required to upgrade the building. Um, so the place that's been considered at the moment is Elamata House. Uh, it's been described by the health professionals as a great location, close to transport. It's in a beautiful setting. So they feel it ticks all the boxes. Um, there were comments that hospital isn't helpful and that the opportunity exists to better meet needs in a non-clinical environment. And some health professionals feel though, and wanted to acknowledge that there, there can be safety and a sense of safety that people receive from that hospital setting. It was reiterated that the location needs to be off site from the hospital, but also in close proximity. The health professionals we spoke to expressed a desire for lim limited clinical support in the safe space, a preference for limited clinical involvement, um, but they said that it's comforting to know that clinical support is available nearby if it's needed. They, um, the health professionals told us that they, uh, that like, uh, they like that the service is starting in the hospital. So what's, what's happening at the moment is because the building isn't yet ready to be used. Um, so the suicide prevention peer workers are actually starting to work alongside people in the emergency department. And so they're starting to get that service running based in the emergency department um, while those uh, upgrades are being made to Elamata House. Um, but generally there was really good alignment between what the lived experience participants want in um, terms of location and what health professionals uh, would like to see. In terms of the service model, it was decided that um, during the conversations or what was proposed during the conversations was that clinical services should not be delivered in the safe space. Um, health professionals said that screening is not de desired by peer workers because it's overly clinical. Um, they also, health professionals spoke about the fact that they, they didn't particularly see the need for screening um, they didn't think it was something that needed to happen when people present at the, at the safe space. Instead, there was, uh, as it was suggested, the focus be that needs be identified in collaboration with each individual, um, whether that being clinical needs or other needs. Um, they commented that some people won't want to have a conversation and that they'll just want to sit there and, and feel safe. Um, and then having a conversation with the person who's seeking support um, but it could also involve having that conversation with the person's support person, if that's what they want. The health professionals we spoke to said that, we, that people need to take the time to understand if the person who's come to the safe space requires support and have resources and information about other services. They said there should be a focus on transparency, that you should ask the person what they need and they should be in, they should be an involvement of the person's natural supports. It was raised that the service response needs to be culturally appropriate, um, and also that there needs to be a backup plan. 
Um, they said, the health professional said that even though it's a non-clinical space, it's still a good idea to have access to the emergency department if needed. And, um, but the focus should be on self-directed support. In terms of connection pathways to and from the safe space, um, so essentially how people get to the safe space, how they find out about it, um, and where will they be connected to when they leave. Um, for pathways in, um, it was commented that there, ne there needs to be education for emergency staff around how to access the service and where it's located. And there needs to be engagement with key staff at the emergency department, such as the EDNUM. In terms of pathways out of the safe space, so where people will be connected to, um, health professionals told us that you need to ensure peer workers have good knowledge of, of the service sector and peer workers need to be experienced in providing navigation support to other services. It was also commented that there need to be strong relationships with GPs, um, that we need to build outward pathways and awareness. Just some general comments that were made by the health professionals um, about pathways. Um, it was commented that engagement with local CMOs is important to arrange meetings and relationship building opportunities. And there needs to be active participation in community meetings and network meetings. They also said that there should be um, efforts to build strong and trusted networks. In terms of staffing and workforce development and support, um, it was commented that always, always it's important to have a plan B if someone needs clinical intervention, but the staff should be trained in supporting each individual to develop what, to identify what types of support they need. Health professionals told us that peer workers should use their own experience combined with formal training. And there was a preference for clinicians not to be part of the safe space. It was commented that line management um, could be provided by someone providing, the, the concern was that um, it was felt that the, the idea of clinical oversight um, was a little bit over the top. Um, and they, it was raised that the person who is in that management role potentially could be mostly doing rostering and team management responsibilities um, rather than having an oversight role. <clears throat> in terms of the needs of this new workforce um, for their professional development and their support, um, the health professionals we spoke to said, that there needs to be as much professional development as can be provided, that this is that it's crucial to develop the capability of the SPP workers. We're also told that um, support that, that's already being received for peers is very much welcomed, um, that historically peers have been really effectively supported within the LHD. Um, there was raised the need for peer worker training with specific skills for suicide prevention, um, access to supervision and peer learning, and also access to conferences and learning opportunities in addition to formal training. In terms of governance, um, we were told that potentially Potentially there's a need for individual safe space government governance, so separate governance. Um, and there's also a need to maintain the fidelity of the intent of the safe space in the way that it's governed. We were lucky to get some really useful information from um, a person who works in the, in the ambulance service um, and provided us some great tips about what what would be needed in order for ambulances to take people to the safe space as an alternative to ED. Um, so we were told that, that we need to address 
duty of care issues in the safe space before ambulances would do that. Um, there'd need to be an in principle agreement around the model, um, but there was recognition that the emergency department can be a really bad place to take someone who's experiencing a suicidal crisis. Um, it would need policy change. So this person did comment that it'd be hard to see how this could be enabled with current policy. And there'd also need to be legislative change to enable pathways to the safe space. And those changes would need to be signed off at state level. So I'm now going to take you through how all of this information that we've collected um, aligns between participants and aligns with the Ministry of Health requirements. So the Ministry of Health already have requirements that have been co-designed um, and I guess you could consider those the non-negotiables. So we aren't able to change those requirements. We're able to co-design the safe space within those parameters. So on the next um, group of slides, what you will see is some of the text that's provided will be in green. If it's in green, it means that what is being said is in alignment with what the Ministry of Health have said and also that there's alignment between what people with lived experience in the Mid-North Coast and people who are health professionals in the Mid-North Coast are wanting to see for the safe space. If it's in orange, it means it's something that we need to talk about for a little bit. Um, we need to have further conversations around it. So um, it might be because there's disagreement or inconsistency between what people with lived experience are wanting and what health professionals are wanting. Or it could be that something has been requested that um, it's, it, it appears at the moment to be outside the Ministry of Health requirements. And so there need to be conversations around how that might be achieved within the actual requirements. It could also be something that we've talked about with health professionals, but not with people of lived experience or vice versa. If you see it in red text, that means that it's actually out of scope. So what has been suggested is something that um, is inconsistent with what the Ministry of Health requires. So it means that we can't actually achieve that with this co-design process. So what we have here are the Ministry of Health guidelines in blue there. Um, and I'll just give you a moment to read over those. It's, um, it's mostly approaches they expect to be followed in the safe space. The information you've got on the right, um, that's from our conversation with the lived experience group in the North Coast. And these are the values that are most important to them. So safety, emotional and physical safety, empathy, equality for all, for staff and guests, having a welcoming place, a sense of belonging, collaboration and networking, respect for all, confidentiality, compassion and care, dignity, honesty, transparency and accountability, and information and education. So I guess you could consider these the standards that the safe space will be held to. So this is information about the location of the safe space. Um, you can see on the left there, we've got what the Ministry of Health have set for the requirements, um, which it says it can be on or off hospital grounds, but it does need to be in proximity of the emergency department. Um, and it does need to be a genuine alternative to accessing the hospital. So you can see that um, the lip People with lived experience have said they want it to be easy to find and accessible. Um, and health professionals have said that it should be off site from the hospital to reduce stigma. So that's all within scope. Um, there's some things there in orange um, that we will need to talk about a little bit further. So that um, proximity to the emergency department um, is, is something that would be welcomed so that people can access clinical support if they need to. 
Um, and we've had that suggestion of Elamata House um, and also that the safe space initially will be established on site, so within the emergency department, and we'll move to that um, Elamata House site at a later date when the renovations and changes have been made to it. Um, so they're, they're things that we can talk about a little bit more. Um, so in particular, you know, will it specifically be located at Elamata House? Um, and is that, are people happy with how close that is to the emergency department? Um, and if, if for some reason that's not able to be used as a venue, what are the other options? In terms of connection pathways, um, the Ministry of Health have made it clear that people should not be required to be referred or have to meet any kind of assessment in order to access help through the safe space or access support. Um, and that there'd be a no wrong door approach. So everybody would be welcomed and everybody would be helped to connect to services that, that, that they choose, that they, would, they see as being helpful for them. Um, the people with lived experience agree that there should be no referral and um, people with the health professionals that we spoke to um, also spoke about how, you know, we, we, we raised this earlier that people in the emergency department need to be educated around what's available at the health safe space and how to access the safe space, uh, that the key people within the emergency department need to build strong relationships with staff in the safe space. Um, there are some things that we'd like to speak about a little bit more. You can see that they're in orange. So um, the lived experience perspective that it shouldn't be a drop-in centre for everyone. So we'll need to have conversations around how what, they, what they're looking for can be achieved within that context of there being no wrong door, which is what the Ministry of Health has said. And the Ministry of Health has said that everybody needs to be welcomed. So we need to have further conversations around how um, we can achieve what exactly the, the people with lived experience are looking for there. Um, in terms of the health pro professional perspectives, um, we do need to further explore links from the LHD to the safe space. And we also need to address duty of care. Uh, we need to speak about what duty of care means, what meeting duty of care will look like in the safe space, um, about risk and governance, because apart from anything else, these are issues that will need to be addressed if the, if the safe space is to become a genuine pathway option for ambulance services. In terms of the outward connections from the safe space, the Ministry of Health has said that they want it to be really closely connected to other support services and local businesses and the community that um, if people do present a risk to staff or other guests at the safe space, they want people connected to more appropriate services to assist them. Um, and that there should be clear protocols around safety and access. Um, as you can see there, most of what um, has been proposed by people with lived experience and health professionals in the Mid-North and Coast area is um, completely consistent with the Ministry of Health requirements, definitely can be achieved through the, um, the co-design process. Um, so that includes all of the comments that have been made about um, referrals, resources, information, support, warm handovers, um, uh, and, and also it's in line with what health professionals are saying about you know, that peer workers need to have really good knowledge of what services are available in the local area, really good relationships with, um, with GPs and, and other key people in the community. So probably the only thing that really needs to be further explored here is this idea um, that it's, it's important to health professionals that the people in the safe space have direct access to clinical care nearby if required. So we, we, we just need to talk a little bit more about that, find out exactly what that would look like in the context of somebody who has approached the safe space. Um, there are also some conversations we need to have that haven't really been explored yet that uh, are, are important in terms of these pathways. So promotion and partnerships in the community with other services and organisations. We know that people want that, but how is that going to be achieved? 
also how people will connect with or arrive at the safe space. Um, arrangements and protocols required to support connection to and from the emergency department if people want that to happen. What happens if someone isn't able to be supported or isn't ready to leave the safe space? And what happens when somebody leaves the safe space? So what sort of follow-up is going to happen after that? We know from the, what the Leos have told us that that follow-up is really important to people. So these are, um, this presents all of the information we've gathered about the staffing of the safe space. Um, so what the Ministry of Health has said is that it will be staffed by suicide prevention peer workers who have their own lived experience of suicide. Um, and you can see that what the people with lived experience want um, is completely in alignment with that, that peer workers have a lived experience of suicide, they be experienced and knowledgeable, um, and health professionals have also said that that's what should happen. But there's quite a lot to talk about still. You can see there in orange font. Um, so the lived experience people, some lived experience people felt that there should be clinicians involved in the safe space um, or that peer workers be trained to screen guests for suitability. That's something that's become um, that there's some divergence in opinions on that. So it'd be good to talk about that more and see if um, people can come to some agreement that is consistent with what the Ministry of Health wants. Um, some things that health professionals have raised that we would like to speak about more include um, that it should be a blended model of peer workers and clinicians. Um, so we need to talk about what the role of clinicians would be given that um, clinical services are not to be delivered in the safe space and just talk about how that might be achieved. Um, we need to talk uh, about direct access to clinicians. So how is that gonna happen? And um, the health professional said services that they need to be managed by clinician to manage risk. Um, so again, this is all, these are all things we need to get more information about because um, at the moment it, 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 we need to do more to develop these ideas to make sure they're in alignment with what the Ministry of Health has said about it being a non-clinical space where people are not going to be assessed. In terms of the development needs, I'm not actually going to take you through this slide because you can see that everyone's in agreement. Um, the health professionals and people with lived experience are, are all on the same page as the Ministry of Health. Um, but you can certainly pause the, um, the presentation if you would like to read through those. Um, but what's really important is what do we need to talk about from here? So. We need to talk about the proposed SPP worker staffing model, which will be two full-time positions. So how is that, how are those two full-time positions gonna be staffed? How many staff members will fill those positions? Um, the training and support requirements for the SPP workforce. So the Ministry of Health, they have said that there's essential and optional training. Is there other training that they would like to provide as well to SPP workers? Um, the diversity of the experience and background of the people who will staff the SPP workforce needs to be spoken about and the functions of the service manager role. In terms of the service model, um, so Ministry of Health says that it's going to be non-clinical uh, that the focus will be on psychosocial reasons for the person's need for support, including loneliness and isolation. Uh, the family and friends will be involved where possible and that people should be able to get information to meet a range of needs. So not just mental health needs, but also housing, relationship counselling, financial assistance, um, help to address the cause of distress and we that we, need, we want to have a safe space where people can be warmly connected to these services. You can see there that the people in lived experience, with lived experience in the mid-north coast area um, 
what they're looking for is completely in alignment with what the Ministry of Health has, has asked for, um, including consideration being given to friends and family. Um, health professionals have also raised a whole lot of um, ideas that are, that are well in alignment with the Ministry of Health and people with lived experience. Just some things that we might want to get some more information on or talk about a little bit further. Are, um, so this idea that clinical services are not delivered in the safe space, it, it's probably quite clear to you now that the, um, the role of clinical services is something that they're having a range of points of view on in the Mid-North Coast area. Um, also the idea that screening is not desired that, that a screening process might be too clinical. Um, with the reason we need to talk about that is because screening is actually something that people with lived experience in the area raised as a possibility. Um, clinical support backup plan. Again, it's about exploring that and how, how is that going to work? How is that going to occur? Um, and exploring this idea of the ability of ambulances to use alternative to emergency department spaces like safe spaces as a place to take people who um, they're providing transport to. But something that we really do need to talk about in, in greater depth with people in the mid north coast area is how are guests, carers, families and friends going to be supported? Um, It'd be good to get some more detail coming out and some firmer ideas about how that will work. In terms of physical environment and accessibility, um, as you can see, there's pretty much complete agreement. Everything is in green here, so I'm not going to take you through all of it, but I will point out that we that the people with lived experience in the Mid-North Coast have said they would like it to be open to everyone and never closed. That's something that we will need to have further conversation about um, in terms of the staffing model and what can be achieved with the number of staff available and the funding available. So um, we can talk about that further. So very definitely we will be having conversations about opening hours. Uh, the style and layout of the physical environment, um, how the needs of specific groups such as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and people from the LGBTQI plus community, um, how men, young people, older people, culturally and linguistically diverse people are going to have their needs met in the safe space. Uh, also consideration about the safety of guests and staff. In terms of governance, um, you can see here that what has been suggested by people with lived experience and what has been suggested by health professionals in the area is um, fairly not, con it's not controversial at all. There's, there's a lot of agreement there, um, but something that has been raised by health professionals is this issue of duty of care and clinical governance. Um, and so there need to be more conversations around how the needs of um, people who are using the safe space are going to be met in a way that health professionals are comfortable with, but is also consistent with Ministry of Health guidelines. So some of the specific things we're going to talk about in the next session, um, management of the service, the key risks in establishing the service and how they'll be managed. Um, arrangements and protocols to support connection to and from other services, opportunities for people to provide feedback and how data is going to be collected and reported. So that's a lot of information that I've just given you. Um, and I appreciate that it's a lot to take in. And I guess it's because we're really getting through, we're getting uh, quite advanced in this co-design process. So a lot has come out of it so far. But um, we're going to put out now a survey. If you go to the Roses in the Ocean site, uh, you will find the link to the survey for the Mid-North Coast um, Health Professional Feedback Loop 2. And if you go to that survey, what you can do is provide us some really 
needed perspectives about the things that you've been hearing about in this presentation. So I guess we're interested in, do you, uh, and to what extent do you agree with um, what you've just seen in the slides there? Do, do the slides represent your perspective? Um, do you, the slides represent what you know about people's needs and how things will work? Um, and if they don't, we'd like to know about it and we'd like to really broaden the perspectives that are being represented in this co-design process to include as many as possible. Um, so we'd also like to know if you have any additional input or suggestions relating to things that um, are going to be a real focus. So the location of the safe space, the connection pathways to the safe space, so how people will get there, and also the connections out. So who will they people be connected with after they leave the safe space? Um, any comments you have about staffing and workforce development or support and those suicide prevention peer workers who will be staffing the service, um, as well as any ideas you have around the physical environment and the accessibility of the safe space. We'll also be asking you in the survey um, some specific questions that we've been asked to present by the local health district. So they are, how should the safe space go about capturing information in a recovery oriented way in order to meet the minimum data reporting requirements of the ministry? Also, do you think it would be useful for the safe space to have a contact point such as an email or a phone number? And if so, how would the safe space manage guests who make contact outside of hours? The third question is, what do you think the responsibilities and or processes for follow up of people who access the safe space? So what should what should be the follow up procedure after people visit the safe space? And um, finally, there's some suggested opening hours. So Monday, 9 to 5.30, Thursday to Sunday, 1 to 9.30 p.m. Um, so what do you think of these hours as opening hours for the safe space? So there's quite a lot that we'd like to hear your opinion on. Um, really encourage you to go to the Roses in the Ocean website. Um, so you've got the, the web address there. Um, so you're going to go to the Mid North Coast LHD page, uh, look for the Feedback Loop 2 webinar and survey links, um, click, click on the survey and uh, tell your friends and tell your colleagues to, to, um, to have their input in the survey as well, because it's really important that we, get, we cover as many perspectives as possible. And we ask that you do this by the 1st of December, um, and then we'll be having our co-design session where we bring everyone together, um, live, people with lived experience and health professionals together on the 3rd of December to have some really important in-depth discussion about some of the things we raised in this presentation. So thanks for joining us today. Um, just stopping the sharing of my screen. I do believe there's a function for questions, but I'm aware that we've made it to the end of the time. Um, but if anyone does have questions that they'd like to ask, you can send them through. Um, you're also welcome to email Roses in the Ocean. We're happy to answer your questions as, um, that way as well. So I'll just give you a moment. Yeah, I don't think there are any questions. So um, thank you for joining us or, or thank you for viewing this and um, spread the word about doing the survey. <laughs>